O painel 5 tem como tema Conhecendo as prioridades de pesquisa em educação financeira na América Latina e Caribe. E já compondo a mesa, temos o moderador, senhor Juan Ernesto Jiménez Olivier, intendente da Superintendência de Valores da República Dominicana. E compondo a mesa, senhora Flor Elise Knowlton, da Dimes, Holanda, senhora Maria José Roa, do Centro de Estudos Monetários Latino-Americanos do México, senhora Ivone Vidiada, do Instituto de Estudos Peruanos, e também senhora Isabela Furtado, do Banco Mundial no Brasil. Passamos agora a palavra ao moderador, senhor Juan Ernesto Jiménez Olivier. Muchas gracias. Gracias a la CBM, el regulador del mercado de valores de Brasil, por este importante acontecimiento. Eh, en José Vasco, su director eh, de asistencia y protección al inversionista. Nosotros hemos visto a lo largo de este día aspectos que tienen que ver con educación financiera. Aspectos que incluyen sus tres componentes fundamentales. Inclusión, hemos visto como desde niños jóvenes, profesores, profesionales, gobiernos y el sector privado trabajan en conjunto para que esto sea exitoso. Temas de educación, desde preescolar vimos eh, importantes ejemplos, educación básica, secundaria, universitaria, pero también educación al consumidor. Y protección, como el resultado de todo lo anterior, en la medida en que se protegen los bolsillos de los ciudadanos y los ahorrantes, se protegen las economías de nuestros países. Sin embargo, ahora nuestros panelistas van a hablar sobre un aspecto que no deja de ser importante y quizás se ha dejado de lado, la importancia de la investigación y la recolección de datos para poder alcanzar una mayor inclusión financiera y, por consecuencia, educación. Paso la palabra a nuestra primera panelista, Flor No. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you for still being here. Um, we know it's around five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, so we're the last thing standing between you and a cold beer. So I will try to be, uh, make it worth your while and be quite brief, um, but try to talk slowly so the translators can understand. So um, I also want to thank Vasco for giving us the opportunity to present a little bit about our research work, which is quite a diverse uh, uh, set of work that we're doing, and for us to suggest some of the research priorities um, for the region based on the work that, that we've been doing here. Um, so I run a small uh, little organization from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, um, through which we provide assistance to institutions um, in the implementation of social and economic inclusion programs. And more specifically, we're trying to basically bridge that gap between the institution and some of the most vulnerable consumers that these institutions are trying to reach, uh, both through evaluation and through the design of financial capability studies. Now, um, I'll be presenting today uh, on the first publication uh, of a greater research project that we've been involved in uh, that's really trying to assess um, what are some of the challenges um, that policymakers and program designers uh, are facing in reaching those very vulnerable consumers and to really try to be that bridge between uh, what the real needs are of vulnerable consumers and uh, how, based on that, some of these financial capability um, programs can be designed. Um, now, before I go into some of the theory that uh, we've looked into and some of the interviews that we've done on this, I want to kind of illustrate my point with um, three photos. So we have been involved in the design of a financial capability intervention for some of the most vulnerable consumers uh, living in Ethiopia. Uh, these are people living on one dollar a day, and uh, we were invited to design an intervention that would increase their savings. Now, when we worked with the framework that we were given uh, by the uh, people that gave us the assignment, um, we envisioned the financial education program to look something like this. So basically something that was set in a classroom setting um, had with a teacher-student kind of relationship. Now, um, while spending quite a bit of time in these communities and really listening to the needs of them, uh, we found out that actually the most convenient delivery point for financial education would be this. 
Uh, and this is one of the agents uh, that functions as a cash point um, for the individuals receiving cash transfers from the government. And this would be the person giving the financial education messages to these people. So as you can imagine, uh, the design uh, phase kind of changed after we found out that this was the best way to deliver financial education messages. Uh, and what am I trying to say with these pictures um, is that because we're obviously trying to design financial capability programs that um, are applicable and relevant for the audience that we're providing it to. Um, and the, the messenger and the location of these financial education messages in key, are key in really increasing the impact of the intervention. And of course, this brings along quite a few policy challenges and design challenges. First of all, um, uh, without access to economic and fi financial opportunities, uh, without the right messenger and without the right content and location, um, learners may not be um, as uh, prone to apply the learned concepts that they learn in financial capability interventions. And this means, means that they're, in spite of policymakers trying to uh, take some of these diversities and these kind of messaging components into account, we see often a disconnect uh, from, the, from the policy level up to the level of the very vulnerable consumer. So we're trying to assess with our research program where does this disconnect um, occur and what may be solutions to really try to find the needs of these most vulnerable consumers. So within the, uh, the project that we're working on now, we're really looking at how can we um, include the vulnerable consumer in the process, design, and implementation of financial capability interventions. So questions that come with that are, for example, how inclusive are the processes of design? How many consultations are happening with the actual target segments, even though they are living um, three uh, days travel away from the closest cash point, for example? Because for these people, just make sure to understand that a little bit of saving can make the difference between having food on the table or not. Um, and we see that, in general, um, it's very difficult to really take some of these specific needs into account. Now, another question that comes with that is, is the use of demand surveys alone enough to kind of fill that gap of inadequate consultations with these target segments? And this is a question that we're trying to assess uh, among regulators and among implementers of financial capability strategies. So we looked into um, the academic uh, literature, into the international policy documents, and so far 22 national strategy documents to see how vulnerability is presented um, in this policy work. And alongside that, what I'll be briefly presenting on today is key informant interviews that we conducted with the implementers of financial capability strategies in Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, and Peru. Now, the majority of people that are in vulnerable situations would not consider themselves vulnerable. So this generates kind of an us and them mindset and leads automatically to vulnerable people being put in some kind of minority uh, categorization. But if you look at the literature and concepts, kind of conceptual development of vulnerable consumers, it becomes clear that vulnerability is actually quite a fluid concept. So it's not just minority groups or low-income people that can be vulnerable, but all of us can at some point actually become a vulnerable consumer. So this clearly presents authorities with a very difficult policy uh, challenge. Now, there's a lot of literature on causes of vulnerability, and I'm trying to pick out one here to kind of keep the presentation a bit short. So Cartwright kind of suggested five kind of causes for vulnerability. What makes people become vulnerable? The first one has to do with access to information and also is very much linked to financial literacy. What do people know of the financial services around them? What do they know about savings that can make people vulnerable if they don't know these things? Pressure vulnerability has more to do with kind of practices in the financial services industry which try to pressure people in buying certain products and makes them vulnerable because of that. Now, the third one has to do with redress. Do people, are people aware of their consumer rights and do they know where to go if they, have, if they want to redress and they have a complaint? Now, the last two have more to do with a lack of access to products and, and programs in that sense. Supply vulnerability means that someone can be vulnerable because they don't have access to any financial services. And the last, impact vulnerability, has more to do that certain losses 
have more impact on particular groups of people, such as low-income people, which exacerbates their vulnerability. And this is definitely a group that we as DIMES work with a lot. Now, what does all this theory mean in practice? So, first of all, the heterogeneity of the concept of vulnerability and also the diverse definitions that are around presents the authorities with big challenges. As the OECD has also published, there is no uh, definition of what a, vo a vulnerable consumer is, not, not within jurisdiction, but also not across jurisdictions. So you can imagine that policy in every country and even in some regions are very diverse in targeting vul vulnerable consumers. Now, second, um, often consumer vulnerability is kind of made equal to disadvantaged, but it's not the same thing because anybody can be vulnerable. It's not just the disadvantage that are vulnerable. And this um, clearly means that segmenting people into di disadvantaged categories may not be the best approach in trying to target them with efficient financial capability um, interventions. And the last, which is something that we've talked about for a couple of days now, is that targeting vulnerable consumers or targeting uh, people in general with financial education programs is quite complicated. There is not a ready set package of what financial program works for which consumer. And there are so many things that had to be taken into account in order to kind of generate an impact. Things like messenger and things like applicability and things like uh, psychological and cultural factors play a big role in the design. So these three things make the, the appropriate design of a program very, very um, uh, challenging. Now, I just got the five minutes of science, so I'm going to really try to do this quickly. So what does this mean? Um, the challenges in designing policy make policymakers actually group consumers into very broad groups in order to be able to provide as many people as possible with financial capability interventions. But however, as we've seen from some of the literature, actually the solutions for financial capability lay in the nuances of people's problems. So the grouping of individuals and consumers may not be the best way to actually target them with financial capability. Now, international and national uh, policy guidance um, kind of generate, uh, have generated a couple of uh, pieces of advice of how you can best tailor your interventions towards the need of the different kind of consumers. And from those, we have um, picked out five, five opportunities where we see the biggest um, kind of opportunity to, to really tailor uh, efforts for specific groups of people. The first one is in the needs assessment. So how are the needs of the different segments determined? The second is how are groups segmented? Is it just a homogeneous group of people or is it a heterogeneous group of people with, for example, different behaviors within each segment? The third is how are vulnerable groups or people included in the actual consultation process in the design? And the fourth and fifth is how are communication channels and how are content um, tailored towards the needs of that specific pop uh, population. Now, don't be afraid of the next slide. I just put it in there because it has a lot of information on the interviews that we did for the different for, uh, case studies. And I want to pick out kind of two things that stood out, two methods that um, were used in order to really tailor needs. Now, one of them, which is great, has already been presented on during this conference, which is the Brazilian segmentation method, where a method of design thinking and behavior design was used to create different personas within every segment. So it wasn't just a segment of youth, but for example, within that, there was another four different behavioral and attitudinal personas that exert different kind of financial behaviors. And based on those, different de delivery systems were also tailored. Now, another way to uh, kind of target these different segments, and this is something that the Colombian strategy has done, is to work very closely with institutions that already have feet on the ground in the communities where people are vulnerable. So, for example, this is the Ministry of Social Prosperity that they lived with. And because of this, they created quite a, um, well, opportunistic kind of uh, collaboration which really reached the different uh, kind of uh, target segments without having to employ new people and in going into the field to assess these needs. Now, I took out a couple of challenges that most of the people that we talked to uh, mentioned, most of the policymakers. First of all, not surprising, finding the delivery channel that's applicable to people in spite of the little income that they have. So looking at messenger, location, how do you reach these people, even though they're living very remotely, for example. The second is the impossibility of reaching vulnerable people on a large scale 
without really using intermediaries. And then the third has kind of a combination of the first two points, which is to ensure that solutions for the population is fit, but at the same time, it really matches the capabilities of the local organizations that you're working with. And the fourth and fifth point is something that we've also discussed a lot here, the coordination of uh, stakeholders and finding strategic alliances to prevent duplication is a challenge that was mentioned by all of the parties that we talked to. Now last, we um, provide a set of recommendations here, I'll go through them quickly, that could potentially be a solution for some of these priority research areas. So the first priority research area that we want to mention is that there should be a conscious investment in inclusive consultations in the development of financial education strategies. So really going into the communities and assessing their needs based on consultation. Uh, second and third, as we saw from the theory, to not deal with segments in a heterogeneous way. So being aware of the fact that even within one target segment, there can be a lot of different behavioral kind of attitudes and behaviors, financial behaviors. And then last, um, making sure, or second to last, that needs assessments really include um, the daily routines of people. And something that may be a solution to this is to using the financial diaries method to really make sure that you get into the financial lives of people to assess why it is that they're not saving or why it is that they are saving or why they're spending. And then last, something that I think um, will be very relevant to mention here is that, of course, we focus a lot on best practices, but something that we're noticing now by interviewing some of these implementers is focusing on challenges can actually give quite a rich uh, data set as well in terms of future financial education development. So maybe at this point, learning from those that are reinventing their strategy are those uh, people to talk to in order to get lessons from those that are kind of embarking on the journey of financial education strategies. Thank you very much.